are we ready to do the show? Nope, but let's do it. Mm -hmm. Let's do it anyway. <laughs> It's body time. This is episode 303 of Insert Credit, the greatest video game podcast on the internet despite our constant horrible buzzer. I'm Alex Jaffe, and the first album I ever owned was, and I'm being completely serious here, Mary Schneider's Yodeling the Classics. Wow. I requested it specifically because I heard it on our local classical radio station. I thought it was the coolest thing I had ever heard, and my mom went out and got it for me. Uh, I'm Frank Cifaldi, and the first album I ever owned, I, my my memories of the cassette, I, I don't have a vinyl period. Um, I know for sure that my first CD was in utero, but uh, I'm trying to recall nice. what my first cassette was. And I believe it was bad. I believe it was Ooh, Michael Jackson's shoot. Bad. That's a single, but... Uh... Wasn't it? An, art, an album? Oh, there is an album. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I don't the, know what the, I'm the, the album. Yeah, not the single. I just, I just, I just remembered the cassette single when you said that. I was like, ooh, that's what I remember. <laughs> you were a singles man. No, no, it was, it's good uh, to have singles. All about, all about the albums from the Kmart or whatever. Oh yeah. Uh, I'm Tim Rogers, and the first album I ever owned that was like mine. I mean, I didn't uh, own a whole lot of stuff as a child. So it's like there was stuff that was my brother's that I got to use. Uh, does any of that count? I don't think sure. that counts. Your lived experience is your own. Yeah, well, but I, think I mean, it goes I, against the, I think it goes against the spirit of the question because like yeah. um, I, I probably, you know, was using some of my mom's cassettes before I got. Yeah. Them. Yeah. It was all uh, just borrowing, uh, listening to my dad's records, borrowing cassettes, uh, dubbing uh, mixtapes with my dad's records all the way up until, I mean... I've I've seen people do the uh, they mention like talk about what what the first album they ever bought with their own money was. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, album I ever had that felt like mine, and I'm specifically choosing one that is uh, one that my big brother wanted no part of, would be probably Nirvana's Nevermind. You know, I just listened to Nevermind the whole way through for the first time like this year. Oh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Those guys are pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was a very I influential on like a twelve year old to listen to that. It was like, yeah, I'm I'm twelve and I like this. I I could understand a person basing their entire personality on this album. <laughs> oh yeah, it's pretty good. But if you're still doing that in your forties, please stop. My yeah, I, I only listen to Nirvana a few times a year. Uh, you see, what happened was eventually I got into the bands that inspired Nirvana, and then mm -hmm. the bands that hung out with the bands that inspired Nirvana. Mm -hmm. So Nirvana's uncles, the bands that produced Nirvana. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. The band. Yeah, basically, uh, I, I got into Steve Albini bands. Uh, and then, you know, it's a slippery slope from there. Oh, yeah. Beanie bandies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beanie bandies. <laughs> well, we got a guest with us this week. Joining us to fill in for Brandon Sheffield, who's away on assignment, is game developer, streamer, and Y2K aesthetic expert, Max Krieger. Happy to be here. Hey, what's up? My name is Max Krieger, as was just said. And which may come as a surprise to absolutely nobody who knows me, my very first album that I have memory of owning was a copy of NSYNC's No Strings Attached, played back on a Atomic Purple Memorex knockoff Sony Discman. Oh, super on brand. Excellent. Right on. Yes. Practically a zygote, I was on brand. That's Y2K as heck. Yeah. I think my sister's first album, or at least one of her first albums, was Aqua, uh, their first album. I don't. Uh, was it called Aquatic, that first one? Aqua? Yeah, you know, they did Barbie Girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know that, uh, that band. Is a band the right? Is it a group? Would you call them a group? I don't think of them as having albums. I think of them as having <laughs> as that having song. Barbie Girl. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, it was called Aquarium. There we go. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Aqua Aquarium. Okay, perfect. They're having a bit of a moment right now with the, the Barbie movie. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. This is their time. There's like a cover of the of the Barbie Girl song in the credits. Did you notice that? Does anybody anybody uh, notice that? Yeah, that's well, what I, you no put I it. noticed. It, I noticed it was just like gently piped in. 
to some song, but it wasn't right. like a yeah. cover of Barbie. It's, yeah, Girl. I mean, it's, and I noticed that was the only appearance of that song in the movie, which is surprising. It was like a sampling that was a cover, but the song Barbie Girl's not actually like about how fun it is to be Barbie. It's about some something more sinister. So wait, <laughs> right. we've all have we all seen the Barber Barbie movie here? I yeah, have. I've seen yes. the Barbie movie. Yes, we've okay. all seen it. Very good. Uh, hold on, let me. I got something for. Hold on. Nice. <laughs> nice. Okay, there we go. That's. Uh, it took me a, a couple minutes to get this thing fired up. Worth the wait. Oh yeah, it was. That's uh, pretty good. We're here now, so we got it. We're ready to go. So. Bingo. You ever kept you waiting, huh? On that soundboard. No, that somehow falls outside my vocabulary. Uh, right. I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, kept you waiting, huh? I'm familiar with that, but I, I don't. Uh, it's, it's slightly outside my, uh, my scope of, of, uh, of interest. Uh, well, I would like to open the floor to this episode uh, for our first topic, which is, which living person would be booed the loudest if they appeared at a video game tournament? Oh, a tournament? Well, is that not just Elon Musk, we, the, which we just witnessed? I mean, yeah, is there something someone wait, Elon Musk was, booed? He was he was booed? Yeah, Elon Musk made an appearance at a Valorant tournament recently. He showed up on screen for like a second and everybody booed him. Oh, I'm that's wondering great. if there's someone who would get a worse reaction at a particular video game tournament. So, so, so Tim doesn't know about this incident, so he was booed very loudly, um, which confused the commentators. They didn't know what the booing was. And then that was followed about 20 seconds later by uh, a very well-orchestrated chant of bring back Twitter. <laughs> That's really good. Yeah. Uh, it, but it also impresses me that uh, people whose job is to know, uh, I don't know, the exact down to the millisecond cool down timings of of, of uh, how many different char champions characters is uh, uh, the super moves uh, or whatever, uh, you know, that these people are just wouldn't be able to conceive of why people would boo that particular guy. <laughs> right. It's like it's like, I, you know, exactly how many. Uh, seconds and milliseconds it takes before you know agent 69's uh a uh, mega uppercut recharges or whatever but <laughs> but you don't uh, you're not familiar with exactly uh exactly why people some seem to be upset with this medium-sized group of people wouldn't like that particular guy <laughs> well you know uh i i worked in the medical field briefly after high school it was my first job um mm -hmm. I, I worked for four years at a, at a clinic and my observation is that um doctors have to trade personality for intelligence oh certainly certainly so mm. i think I, so i think there's uh something similar happen happening with these these commentators they maybe don't have like uh um social intelligence or something right but they yeah that would make sense they know about the cool downs they got a min max <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they're fine people, and they actually do know about this. And they're just oh, certainly, the moment. of course yeah, they like are. If, yeah, they're, yeah. if they're if they are fans of the Insert Credit Show, and of course they are, um, know that we actually love you, and we understand that when you are commentating live, uh, you know that you, you you can't access every part of your brain. Valorant, man, is it called Valorant? That's how I pronounce it. I don't watch uh, any Valorant action, uh, but I've played a little bit of it. That game's nice. Whatever. How about that? Well, God, he hasn't been in the spotlight a long time. That that trolley lawyer that the like like ten years ago was uh, uh, Jack Thompson. Jack, Jack Thompson, yeah, Jack Thompson. Yeah, speaking Maybe of that 2000s. guy, is that guy not dead yet? Did, he, I think he got disbarred. Yeah, he did. You, oh, yeah. he did. He. Oh, you want to yeah. know what's interesting? You want to know what's interesting? Elon Musk would get booed louder in general, despite having like fans. He would get booed louder than like simply because people know what he looks like. Right. If you flashed up Henry Kissinger or whatever, right? Um, oh like, my god, like, would he get less booing than Elon Musk? You read my mind. I was thinking that I was thinking like I was making a diagram in my mind, like you know, a four pane window. Like who's actually worse but gets booed less? Yeah. Yes, it's, it has to do with knowledge and visibility <laughs> versus actual loathing. Yeah, I'm wondering yeah. the circumstances that would bring Henry Kissinger to a Valorant <laughs> tournament. That's very well. That probably it would it would be more like a Call of Duty tournament. Probably right, right. I think there if they were to uh, manufacture some reason to have him appear in a Call of Duty game, that would be very funny. They got Reagan in there. Second, yeah, they got Reagan in there, and he's a uh, you know he's he's living it up. You know that they the, Reagan's alive in that game. Kissinger was friends with the bands that inspired Reagan. Yeah, <laughs> why not, right? Yeah, so it's it's like remember when there was that poll for like worst company ever or worst company in the world, and gamers ballot stuffed it so that it was EA, 
uh, won the title of worst company ever. Do you remember this poll uh, of, no, of you know some renown? I, it I have a vague recollection. Of it. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a sort of thing that has a vague recollection of itself. You know, there's a lot of facts like that, but uh, that's that's similar to like Elon Musk being possibly the most loudly booed guy that would sh- that could show up at a video game tournament. Um, I mean, I can think of people who deserve to get booed more. David Cage. Yeah. yeah, he should get he should get booed more more than Musk. No, come on. Uh, maybe. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Elon Musk. Elon Musk hasn't specifically done anything wrong to video games, but I guess that's beside the point because the people who attend video game tournaments do, you know, they hypothetically the they exist in the in the outside world. They're they're human people. Yeah, I don't think it gets bigger. I yeah, think, I think we've already seen the biggest. Yeah, I mean, Mark. Mark Zuckerberg wouldn't even get booed that much. Not as much, no. Bill Gates would probably get cheered. Yeah. Right? People would be excited to see Bill Gates. Uh, Donald Trump, I don't want to know. I don't want to know what the answer would be there. Uh, Right? It'd be a really strange sound. Like yeah. like something that's never been recorded in human history. <laughs> yeah, something something that people in Tokyo would pay thirty dollars to listen to in the basement. <laughs> you know, I think an important observation about gamers' rage is that it is powerful, but it is fickle, and so I think timing's yeah. an important component. Yeah. Um, my yeah. leeway, my my segue being, um, give it three months, Todd Howard. Uh- <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a good point to end on. Here's our next topic. How do you know if a puzzle game is too hard? Is it called Steven's Sausage Roll? That's a good question to ask. That game's a little too hard. Uh, I don't know. I like it, though. Is that a, a puzzle game? Like, what, what puzzle games are we talking about? All kinds of puzzle games. Let's say The Witness, for instance. Is The Witness too hard? And how would you even gauge that? No. Have you had to urinate in a jug yet? If you hadn't. I remember. Hmm. I'm laughing. Okay. The, okay. It's, you it's a quiet laugh. You don't <laughs> I get the, it. I get you. you. Know, camera on, acknowledged. I yeah. <laughs> I'm laughing about the urine. Urine makes me smile. So, I mean, okay. So uh, just to, to get some talk going. For me, I bounce off of a puzzle game as soon as, like, I go to play the game and I start playing. And then I have a feeling like I'm doing work and not having fun. Uh, I don't yeah. know if that's fun or just design right or if there's a difference between the two i guess but um yeah but that that that's when i bounce is when it's like there's nothing in this for me except work like i feel like i'm turning on the work part of my brain like i'm answering email if this were a couple of years ago uh i would think the the correct answer to this question would to how do you know when a puzzle game is too hard the correct answer would be uh if jonathan blow tweeted about liking it uh because he had he had a thing where i remember he had like a big long i don't know how big and long it was he had a twitter thread about the game threes Mm -hmm. do y'all remember this yeah where he was like this game sucks because it's so easy and he just goes (laughs) off on his uh uh just you know talking about how he can't wear hats anymore because they just (laughs) they burst on his head because his brain is so big uh because three and that's how easy threes is for him uh or whatever like he's talking about how the game's too easy and then every time he recommended a puzzle game there would it would be accompanied by a trailer or an animated gif of some sort that i would watch and be like hmm you know it just looks like a very persnickety sort of game so that's my answer i guess to me it feels like a particular challenge as a puzzle game developer like when you're making the puzzle game yourself, how do you really take a step back and think, will people enjoy solving this? Well, this is where the the thought experiment of Miyamoto's wife comes into play. You need, <laughs> oh. you need, first of all, you need Miyamoto's wife's phone number. That's what she needs. You need. <laughs> okay, I got that. What else? And we're going to reveal it right now. <laughs> we're, and here it comes. <laughs> Five, six, one. That's, uh, it is uh, six, six, six. Uh, she's the, Miyamoto's wife is the devil. Um, it's, you, need, you need your own version of Miyamoto's wife, basically. You need people who are playing the game for you. And uh, this is a fun thing. You know, if people stop inviting you to stuff because you keep asking them to play your game that's that's how you know it's too hard <laughs> right so it's uh it's a good question uh you just need people to play it jeffy um that's how i believe that's how games like baba is you and get made is uh, uh which i think is a puzzle game with a very very wonderful balance of being hard and uh being tricky i think tricky is a good word the game the game is very tricky it's maximally tricky. You feel like it's tricking you and then you have to trick it to solve the puzzle and the puzzles and then it's just it's fun. It it's got a very fine balance and I believe that was achieved through 
uh, ultra extremely hyper mega rigorous playtesting. That mirrors my experience as a as a puzzle game developer. I, uh, for context, I made an arcadey puzzle game called Cross Sneak Plus uh, back in twenty nineteen. It's kind of I like played a... that game. Oh, you did? Yeah, I played you that did. game. Nice. I'm glad you played it. Yeah, I, I believe I was sent a code for it when I was working at a, a particular video game website. And that code was probably sent by me because I was the it only was, one yeah. codes. It was, yeah. I believe it was, yes. <laughs> yes, that's probably. Um, but I, I totally agree with that. And the thing I kind of experienced, everyone says first impressions are everything. And the first impression of a puzzle game is the first aha moment when the mechanics finally click. Um, mm-hmm. People can be discouraged. They can be discouraged from getting to that aha moment, and that's kind of a lead-up that should be considered. But if you get them to that first aha moment, that's like that's like blast-off for your, for your rocket. And then to break the atmosphere, you can't put too much drag. So once they have the aha moment and they feel empowered, you kind of trickle in the challenge just enough for them to feel you know like they're continuing to gain altitude they still have a reference point but not enough to where it drags them back down and it's a really delicate balance because you only get the aha moment once that you only get that once from anybody who plays it Mm -hmm. and um, that's the make or break from my experience so the right puzzle game only has one trick uh not necessarily but i guess it depends on for each mechanic you introduce you get an aha moment and then the it builds some complexity from there cross sneak plus was a very simple game it only had that one aha moment for the the core mechanic and it introduced modifiers to it but with something like baba baba is entirely made of aha moments yeah yeah i believe i once asked this panel if it's the best puzzle game ever made and the answer was a resounding sure why not why not yeah i love a good why not (laughs) there's people out there who think the phrase why not is negative did you know this i'm not going to comment on who it's just uh, there's somebody i know (laughs) <laughs> thinks that when I say why not, I'm being negative. I'm not. If it was a problem, we'd dispute it. It's about as enthusiastic as I get. I want to talk about the immersive arcade experience. It's not something that happens a lot anymore, but it was something people were trying in the past. Is there some kind of like experimental arcade that somebody tried that you've been obsessed with? Like what kind of weird arcade would you make? Uh, when you say arcade, do you mean like... Arcade, or do you mean a game? I mean a arcade? physical space that you visit to experience video games. Okay, then, sorry, repeat the question then, because I was, I, was, I was trailing into thinking about interesting machines. But, okay, so what is it? Uh, yeah, uh, there were a lot of efforts in the 90s and the 2000s to create these interesting immersive arcade experiences. Oh, like game works and stuff. Yeah, okay, exactly. got it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so is there something that was tried and didn't work that is kind of a shame it didn't get that far or an idea for a kind of arcade that you had in your head? I mean, I, every time I'm with a particular group of friends and uh, we happen to somehow stumble upon an arcade that has linked Daytona cabinets, that was always a really good time. And I feel like you could still have those. Like, you remember those Battletech? Was it Battletech that had the big enclosed pods at, like, the, the block parties and whatever, the game works is, uh, that you could go into and you get enclosed inside this thing and you play this really, really slow-paced uh, kind of poindextrous uh, robot battlefield game, right? Like, I feel like if that game had been cool, which it wasn't, I played it uh, exactly twice. If that game had been cool... Or if you had put a cool game in a venue like that, I think that would have been pretty, pretty good. You could still have stuff like that. I don't know how how often anybody here has been to a mall in America recently, though uh, there's a mall that I like to go to in Hudson Valley, New York, called the uh, the Grand Palisade Center. And that mall has a go-kart track uh, inside. Okay, so that mall has stores. Malls have stores these days, right? But not so many of them because people like Amazon. I don't know if this is a, if this is new information for anybody. So for a mall to survive as a huge brick and mortar space, it needs to have a bunch of experiences in it. So there's like in in the Grand Palisades Mall, there's a there's a Ferris wheel, there's a a tomahawk throwing arena, there are multiple escape rooms, there's a full sized go kart track, there's a virtual reality room, there's a spa with you know uh, sensory deprivation tanks there's there's just all sorts of stuff in the mall scattered around throughout the stores and the mall is a big giant thriving 
mall, I feel like there could they could they could afford to make, but like the virtual reality place that's like you can you can sit in this floating virtual reality chair and play one of these experiences. You walk by and it's just one person sitting in a chair in the middle of a store the size of like what could be a GameStop or whatever. And it's like I'm just thinking in terms of the go kart track, and I'm like, what if you could combine if you had a really good game and those those sensory deprivation pods, you know, where the people are playing, I don't know, not virtual reality pods, dude, pods. All right, pods, pods. With, with VR, it brings up an interesting point in that, like, part of the whole appeal and like charm of the arcade, um, as it scaled, was was spectacle. Um, you know, mm-hmm. ooze and Oz. But the problem with ooze and Oz is that as the ooze and Oz get bigger, they scale in cost and they scale mm-hmm. in, you know, complexity. And that's kind of where stuff like um, GameWorks um, and those big, big concepts, they were just giant, you know, spectacles. And a lot of stuff was purpose built. I think of that ride at, or that, I guess, ride and game at GameWorks that was essentially like a, a carnival drop tower that they built a giant screen for. And it was, you had to play like a, a yeah. shooting gallery game and you were going up and down. There's, there's stuff like that, that you're, it's a big commitment to spectacle, but it's kind of lumbering in that you can only build one of those like once every 10 years, like from experience of stuff like on, on the contrast with the fighting game community, where I feel like a lot of the arcade spirit, the feistiness of the arcade, uh, the boisterousness lives on, you know, you see people playing like the, the classic anecdote of people playing their favorite fighting game, like, like Melty Blood in a bathroom hooked up on a laptop. That's always the mm-hmm. joke about, yeah. Um, so the strength of arcades in that sense, I think is, is partially the spectacle, but it's also being seen, you know, it's being seen playing and seeing other people playing socially. And I, in an ideal scenario, it's like a scene. It's a scene where you play and others play and you interact about how you play. And it's hard to do that when you have a, a big three-ring circus like a game works. Um, and with modern malls, they're they're doing that too, and it's working kind of, but it also kind of feels like a Band-Aid to the problem. Um, I also think of I think of Barcades as well, which had a big boom back in the 2010s. They were kind of a step closer to that, but it mm-hmm. felt like it was too fueled by nostalgia. Like the statement of that mm-hmm. scene was, mm-hmm. remember this? And that was cool for the hot minute that people who grew up in a certain era socialized around it, but it didn't have staying power because it didn't really have an identity of its own. So I think I think scene and what scene means and what the statement of the scene is is a big part of it. I worked at a barcade for two years that had a really cool policy uh, where they had a night once a week where uh, all of the cabinets had fighting games on them. And you had to give up your seat if you lost a match. But if you were winning at the top of the hour, you got a free drink. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that was the kind of stuff they were doing over at 10th Level Tavern, which I believe is still in operation post-pandemic. Uh, check them out if you're in South Florida. Uh, Steaks. So as, 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 as I'm thinking through this, I might even I might have the opposite answer. Like, I actually keep thinking about GameWorks, not because I think it was perfect, but I think an arcade should be a place where you can go hang with a group of friends right and yeah you know the one of the only notions we have for that right now is you can drink with your friends and then there's games and right. and you know i'm more interested in like a weird playful base uh, of discovery where there's like i don't know slides you know like like and, and like places to sit and 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 hang out with each other and and like weird hallways to walk down and stuff the much like that. discussed third place uh yeah 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 and that's kind of where my mind goes is is making a place that you might go visit and literally not play a game even though you're surrounded by them because it's just like kind of fun and cool to be there the comforting atmosphere of the game i don't know if it's uh-huh. comforting it's just interesting but uh that said, um, you know, that's a fun idea and probably not a business. So uh, I think just Barcade. Okay. Um, here's my next topic for you. Between the years 2000 and 2019, what was the worst year for video games? Ooh, the worst year? Yes. Hmm. The worst year of the 21st century for video games before the pandemic. Shoot. Um, I feel like the, the first year of... The PlayStation 2 and the first year of the PlayStation 3 weren't super duper great, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, I feel like when the PlayStation 3 came out, it was pretty dire. But we had we had our 360s, though. Yeah, you already had a 360, so it's tough, yeah. And also the Nintendo Wii came out that year as well, so mm-hmm. that's... Uh, the the PS2, how, how about that PS2, though? It had Kessen and uh, SSX. 
There were a bunch of late PS1 games at that time, though. I mean, this might be cheating, but also when that came out, you could go to Best Buy and get a five foot tall stack of Dreamcast games for like $30. Yeah, or you could get on IRC and just download every Dreamcast yeah. game and True. just run them. In 2000, we had Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. We had uh, yeah. Majora's Mask. We had Baldur's Gate 2. We had Final Fantasy 9. Yeah, I had some good ones, but uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of good games all the time every year, you know, despite what what uh, lots of people will immediately say. There's you know, no good games or there's no good movies. There's only superhero movies now. There's never there's no other kinds of movies. Nobody's making anything else. There's always really good stuff. Uh, it's just uh, so when you're trying to talk about what the worst year was, it's got to be the year that had the worst big triple a exclusives probably is probably the best way to to define it right even if that's not what you're most interested in like what 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 are the some of the triple a exclusives of some of these years there there could have been stuff that that sold really well like i think the nintendo wii's launch games wii sports i think wii sports is stupid i know lots of people loved it i think it's dumb and I think Twilight Princess is like a bad Zelda. Yeah. It's, it's like, right? So it's like, they may have sold really well at the time, but in hindsight, it's like, oh, those kind of sucked. There's a lot of good party tricks that, that Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. In 2006, everyone was crazy about Oblivion, which is like the worst Elder Scrolls game. Yeah. Yeah. It has none of the personality of Morrowind and none of the uh, Skyrim of Skyrim. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Exactly. Oh, yeah, that was one of the questions I was going to ask: is how do we quantify badness? Is if we quantify it by cultural legacy and sort of the kind of ep epic that it represented? Um, mm -hmm. I might throw uh, my my hat in the ring for 2013. That was a pretty bad year. Um, 2013 had Bioshock Infinite, Last of Us. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, um, Bioshock Infinite in particular sticks out to me. Um, and oh, just kind babe, of you're in the right show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just kind of this this era where. Um, there was this kind of performativity about, you know, video games reaching cinematic art in the mainstream and Bioshock Infinite was their front runner. That was the horse that they bet on. Uh, it was not, it would not be the horse that I would have bet on in, in hindsight. Um, but we got some other ones. Uh, DMC Devil May Cry uh, came out that year, which kind of mm. um, marked a really important period in how Japanese games were doing on console. That was kind of like the culmination mm -hmm. of the of the dream of we have to shop out all of our Japanese IPs to Western studios because they get it and we don't. Um, and that was, I don't know, in hindsight. And even a year later, 2014, you started to get like the PS the PS4 came out that year and those yeah. notions were dispelled. Well, no, 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 2012. PS4 came PS4 out in November of 2013. Oh, 2013. So it's the same yeah. year. So that was kind of, that ended that year. Um, and because uh, it was after... Grand, Th Grand Theft Auto 5 came out September of 2013, and then the PS4 came out a couple months after that, yeah, which was interesting. Even in the first year of the PS4, you started seeing some Japanese stuff really deliver, and so that was proven to be, you know, a myth, erroneous, but yeah, I guess. DMC was kind of the <laughs> embodiment of that of that bad bet. So yeah, 2013 was was pretty bad. 2012 was pretty bad as well. But I keep thinking back to it. It might have been one of those years, but like the most cynical I ever felt, and Tim, you and I have absolutely talked about this on this show, was that E3 with the weird Sony press conference where everyone was out for blood. <laughs> yeah, one, you know, like 2013. Like, Wait, 2012. That was 2012. Okay. Where they had the they showed The Last of Us with the uh the shotgun blast. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then everyone just like like started ripping their shirts off just and screaming yeah. belligerently. What on earth? Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they didn't really rip their It's just we were at this press conference and it was just like all the trailers were just hyper violent. Just, really you know, really dark and dark. Like Kratos yeah. like mutilating an elephant or whatever and it's just like it just <laughs> it just felt like all of the games were just very like cynical and gross and everyone in that room uh, was just like screaming for blood, and that is just the most detached uh, I've ever felt from video games. I think a lot yeah. of unhealthy stuff also comes out around that late 2012, 2013. That's when Candy Crush gets really big. That's when uh, Grand Theft Auto Online launches, which isn't bad in of itself, but it does kind of represent a stagnation. Mm -hmm. uh, like Rockstar is still stuck in 10 years later. Yeah. 
Beyond Two Souls. Beyond Two Souls was 2013. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, that ought to do it, right? I mean, <laughs> isn't that the worst David Cage game? It's, it's, it's really hard yeah. to figure out what the worst David Cage game is, isn't it? Oh, that's a good question. It's, it's, we we oh. don't need to answer that now. I might, have to, I, I might have to circle that. By virtue of just like having Willem Dafoe in it. Yeah. Beyond Two Souls might just by default be the worst one because Willem Dafoe rules and to see him Willem defiled by being in a David Cage game is uh, is really, really sad. Um, I think the gross way that it treats Elliot Page, I think, yes. kind of makes it the number one candidate. Oh, it's abs- yeah, it's uh, and I mean, that's that's actually a pretty tall order against Detroit Become Human, yeah. the game that's not about racism. <laughs> Like uh, that's that's like a pretty that's that's a that's a tough one to beat. Max, I think you're right. I was going to argue for 2014 because it's like when Gamergate starts, but yeah. 2013's a good one. Yeah, and th- th- that pot was already boiling back then. Anyway, it was there. Right, right, right. Yeah. Oh, that pot was boiling in like 2007, dude. <laughs> yeah, I saw it. Here's my next topic. You have a GDC panel, but you need to make sure that zero people attend. What do you title it? I don't know. I think that's uh, I think that all of the tricks uh, that you could possibly think of to get nobody to show up at a GDC panel. Uh, I think all of those tricks wouldn't work because yeah. uh, people are expecting people at GDC expect tricks, right? Like remember, uh, remember when Will Wright gave a talk and it was secret, but everybody showed up. It was packed. It was filled. Remember that? Were you at that one, Frank? Uh, no, but I was. I was at that GDC, and that's all anyone talked about. Are we talking about the yeah. spore reveal or a different one? The w- the one where he just got up there and talked for an hour about all sorts of stuff. He had a big old PowerPoint, just had a million things in there. Talked about Advance Wars too. No, I didn't. Said it that was one. his favorite game he ever played. It was weird. Oh, I love Advance Wars too. He said, <laughs> and like everything I think of, it's like it's hard to make a it's hard to make a title that no one would attend because no matter what you do by virtue of of having a talk on the schedule you are making a statement that this might be useful to you yeah so if i had a panel and it was like updates on development for the 3do or something people would be like well that's interesting what's going on there i bet that's funny like and like some people would come like i would go to that probably because like what are you talking about it's like 90 percent of those sorts of titles you could put up there would be like i think hideo kojima's gonna show up at this right and then people (laughs) will show up there like this clearly is a reference to uh to pt or whatever like if i were to have a, a a talk that's titled like micro transactions in 2025 why they matter or whatever it's like that's like pretty bland sounding but it's also all like, the money people are coming yeah 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 i've i've got a strategy um yeah. i got my, my 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 two ends would be to, to make it as niche as possible and to stage its major pillars against each other and what i generated from that was co-op studio structures for web3 game development in the aerospace sector <laughs> yeah <laughs> now people show up for that Oh, I'm just trying to make it as oil and water as possible. Well, that makes it compelling. Co-op game development studio, uh, Web3, aerospace. Uh, so, I mean, some money person is going to be like, oh, what's the one that says Web3 at this hour? Got it. Yeah, I guess that's true. They just they just control F for Web3 and show up. Yeah. Okay, I got one. On the show program, it just says, in all caps, talk canceled. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. The old Bugs Bunny. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'd show up to that one <laughs> just to have a place to, uh... <laughs> to crack a beverage. Oh, you'd go there for a quiet space. Yeah. And you'd be disappointed <laughs> that there actually is a talk. Yeah. I'm impressed that people showed up to my GDC talks. I had one that was called Video Games Are Better Than Sports, and it was packed. It was 100%. It was capacity. Why wouldn't that be? Well, everyone there is like, yeah, that's what I've been saying this whole time. <laughs> yeah. Finally, someone gets it. <laughs> My dad was wrong. What year was that talk? That would have been 2014. Okay. 2015, sorry. Uh, something like that. 2016. One of those years. I'm just messing with everybody at this point because I don't <laughs> want people to watch it. Do your own research. <laughs> it, it's probably not on YouTube, so don't don't worry about it. 20 xdx it's just anything you could come up with there's some money person who's like there who thinks there's business in it yeah and if you go things that obviously no one thinks there's a business in like the 3do or whatever then you're gonna get the weirdos coming up to be like what's this about i would go to development for the 3do so that fails immediately yeah 
Do you know, I forget the exact count, but if you were a 3DO developer, you had access to, I, don't, I think you might have had to purchase it, but I believe it was a 120 CD set of assets that you could use for free if you publish games on the 3DO. So oh, somewhere out there, there is a giant repository of, of 3DO appropriate assets. 3 d appropriate. And if you have them, send them to the Video Game History Foundation. I will rip those discs and uh, put them on. You know what? Well, uh, what I always wanted to do was uh, clear the rights and uh, do a game jam just with 3DO assets. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. That would rule. 3DO is fun. Yeah. I think 3DO is a neat idea. Except they got that Gex on there. <laughs> The only flaw. It's the best version of Gex, though. I don't remember if I said it on the show or not. Gex one is a is a easy easily a C, a, not even gonna minus, just C Super Nintendo platform game. But the 3DO version is the uh, the 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 lesser of multiple evils, you would say. Yeah, it, it runs better than the PlayStation version. Yeah, I'm gonna be honest. I thought this question was gonna be a lot funnier. Uh, Y'all took it very seriously, which I suppose <laughs> is your job. Well, yeah, I mean, we could have said things like you will get anthrax here as like you know, <laughs> I, I've been to too many GDCs, though. It's the thing. Right. It's like I've been I've been to too many GDCs and I've given talks with names that were very bland. I gave a talk at a thing called the failure workshop once. Well, let's think about whether we want to be truth tellers or comedians while we take a quick break. Yeah, I'm going to go to the old toilet and check out Mr. Toilet. I'll be back. Right, yeah. Uh, Max, this is your opportunity to get a drink or go to the bathroom while we recharge for part two of this show. Bodily liquid movements only. Welcome back to Insert Credit. It's time for us to go to the dirt bag. This is the point in every episode where we take one of the questions submitted to us by those kind patrons at patreon.com slash insert credit, where even you listening right now, if you aren't already, can join. Uh, by just kicking us a few dollars every month. You get access to this form that lets you submit questions. You also get monthly bonus episodes and other cool stuff, like if we have an ad, you don't have to listen to it, that sort of thing. Uh, our question this week comes from our old favorite, Spencer Gifts, who asks, which Japanese game is the most American, and which American game is the most Japanese? Oh, good question. Well, DMC. That's a discuss, yes. That's not American though. <laughs> that's uh that's a British game. So mm. that's a British one in it. Low hanging fruit here uh, is Metal Wolf Chaos, obviously. You know, mm. the, from from software trying to make the most American game possible. Yeah, well, okay, so first of all, I don't think Metal Wolf Chaos is trying to be American. I think it's Agreed. using Amer I think it's a very Japanese game and it's very proudly Japanese, but it has some uh it just has America in it, which uh is a is a choice, I guess. I don't know. That game's cool, though. Whatever. Is Sonic 2 a cheat? Is that an American game that's very Japanese? Yeah, mm. I mean, that's like the most Japanese possible American video game. Yeah. I mean, it, it was the DMC Devil May Cry of its day. Except, oh, in fact, uh, I'd say Zon Sonic 3 is even more Japanese than 2. Yeah. In, 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 in it, especially with its staff role. Um, but again, I don't know if that's cheating because it's just like... There's a bunch of Japanese people being relocated temporarily to California to make a game that make it an American game. I don't think so. Okay. I mean, as far as like the IRS is concerned, yes, it does. <laughs> uh, but in terms of like these these particular rules, uh, uh, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. I think it has to be American developers making a Japanese feel Japanese game style game. Well, I mean, you know, we've got, I, I always, you know, this is just, a, you know, a game that I, people are probably tired of hearing me talk about this one, but uh, Shadow Madness for the uh, Sony PlayStation, <laughs> Shad Mad, uh, is literally Ted Woolsey and the boys trying to cook up a Final Fantasy VII-like and uh, succeeding spectacularly, in my opinion. Um, phenomenal video game. Uh, it's it's a wonderful, uh, a beautiful video game. I love that game. Uh, it's it's not very good, uh, but it's it's great, and it's very much just it's it's straight up a JRPG. You know, this is kind of br resuscitating that hopefully dead discourse from several months back as to it is the term JRPG uh, problematic or whatever. As someone phrased it on Twitter, could it, are you saying an American developer couldn't make a JRPG? No, they could. They did. They made uh, several of them. It's it's a type of RPG. I don't know. 
Uh, they did with Shadow Madness. It's a Japanese style role playing game. Similar weirdo <laughs> game, uh, Septera Core, uh, comes to mind. Yeah. Also, this came out of um, well, Monolith Productions published it. I'm looking at the the stat sheet on this right now. It was developed by this Valkyrie Studios, and uh, I quote: According to IGN, many of the Valkyrie Studios team had previously worked on the Beavis and Butthead game for Viacom, a highly acclaimed graphic adventure. I actually <laughs> liked that that Beavis and Butthead game. The, that would be virtual stupidity, which uh, uh, not a good game, I would say, but uh, uh, <laughs> real, real good writing and acting. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be serious talking about virtual stupidity for a second. The problem is that uh, there's no branching. It is entirely one state at a time driven. So you can't be like, well, I don't know how to solve this puzzle. I'm going to work on anything else. The game for the entirety of the game is there is one thing to solve. And then that unlocks the next thing. So. Very poor adventure game design. Should have been called actual stupidity. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say, I would chalk that up to Beavis and Butthead being unable to track more than one thread at a time. Uh, you are being very generous to ICOM simulations right now. Those god darn guys, <laughs> Beavis and Butthead. Go back to Shadowgate. Oh, I thought you meant ICOM. <laughs> very good. Okay, so, I mean, I don't know if we answered this. So, like, so, uh, where my brain goes is, like, any, any American-made, like, retro-inspired thing is is based on old japanese games i mean shovel knight that's a yeah. that's an american video game and it's it's uh i mean we're now just kind of I, I i'm now pushing this toward talking about quality what's what's a really good video game that is very much a japanese style video game that's made in america uh, shovel knight fits all of the ticks yeah. all the boxes mm -hmm. it's got everything that was great about all of the nes games from japan that you may have liked um, but they're all just refined and very tasty. Anytime fight. any American makes any visual novel, it's a Japanese style game. Well, I'm yeah, trying to think of the yeah. opposite now. Like, what is a what is an American style game? I go toward like computer RPGs and point and click adventures, and I don't even know what else, right? Um, yeah, I like and and my brain went Black Onyx. It's like, well, does Hank Rogers count as Japanese? No, interesting. <laughs> So what about a uh, Japanese American video games made in Japan? What about this? Uh, yeah, that's what I'm trying to. Is it Metal Wolf Chaos? The joke answer. Binary Domain is also up there. If you look at what was trending at the time it came out, it was still, Binary it's... Domain's close. Yeah. Is it Vanquish? Vanquish is uh, Vanquish is difficult. Uh, Vanquish is, is is kind of up there. It was trying to be a uh, 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 you know like a Gears of War like game, right. except from Japan. So, I mean, where, where my brain tries to go is like, okay, this has to come from a place of passion, right? Like the, the best, you know, Japanese style American made games are coming from people who really love Japanese games, right? And I'm trying to think of what the, of the opposite and, and I'm just kind of coming up blank because I'm... I have, I have yeah. a definitive answer. Um, okay. The, all, all of the Ukes developed SmackDown versus Raw WWE games. Oh. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's a good answer. But also, uh, Ukes was like kind of the owner of that style of right. wrestling game in general. Uh, like they were the inventors, and uh, they were they were behind it all. You know, yeah. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing us that was an American video game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which uh, I mean, that maybe that makes the answer even more correct, right? Like, who knows? The, de the devil in this case probably being Vince McMahon. Exactly. As he is in practically all scenarios. That uh, god darn guy. I'm just uh, basically I'm looking down a list of Unreal Engine 3 games mm. that are made by Japanese studios. Uh, so it's like, which uh, which ones of these? God, there's a lot of Unreal Engine 3 games. Whew, there's too many of them. There's too many of them, Jerry. All right, I'm invested and I need you to name at least one. That's a good candidate, so I'm going to give you some time to figure this out. I'm, I'm looking, uh, hmm, hmm, hmm. I mean, none of these are super exciting. Shoot. Unreal Engine 3 was cool, yo. Did anybody here ever check that out? Yeah, maybe a little bit. It was pretty good. I, we are past time. I would like to move on <laughs> unless you have okay. one last thing you'd no, like I to pull have on one. this list. Was 3 the one with the raccoon tail? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, got it. Uh, yeah, that's the one where you could turn into a statue. Okay. Here's my next topic. When in visual design is ugliness a feature, and who's the best at it? Oh. When you're uh, in a dark, hellish landscape or an alien landscape, right? Um, when is when, ugliness? Yeah. yeah. When do you want things to look bad? 
And who's good at pulling that off? I'm having a hard time with the second one, like uh, the second part of that. Like the first part of it, I think, is just like when you want people to feel uncomfortable. Ugly is a pretty good way yeah. of doing that. Um, you know, I think of like, you know, weird, you know, game makery style things that have been ugly, like uh, uh, like Space Funeral is ugly, but it's like for a mood, right? Um, right. Yeah. Sort of that crust punk itch stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Ugliness. But that second part of that question, I'm having a hard time with. Like, I don't, I don't have, like, an artist roster in mind for Ugly, you know? Well, you could name a studio or a particular game that does it well. Well, I just did that. Yeah, well, you've solved my riddle. Congratulations. I solved the riddle. Mortal Kombat, historically, is pretty ugly. Even today, it doesn't look like it. They're, tr- they're messing around with it with the new one. But I would say that most of Mortal Kombat is ob- obliquely ugly looking. Yeah. Yeah, throughout the whole history, I'd say. It's yeah. like now it's uh it it does get like a little bit uglier when it becomes 4K 120 FPS or whatever it, it's it's like reasonably uglier. I think if it looked nicer, it would be more disturbing to see that like visceral disembowelment of everybody. Those right. absolutely bonkers fatalities, yeah. yeah. And that's making me think about Midway and about how I don't know during like the the golden age like 90s Midway. Ed Boon, Eugene Jarvis era, they really leaned into the ugliness to kind of sell their... They, they watched a bunch of Paul Verhoeven movies, essentially, and tried to do that, but for arcade games. And so th- that wasn't to make it like repulsive and to put the player on edge. It was just like to engage with some lowbrow hunger that existed in players at the time. I think the answer is Mortal Kombat. We're, 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 yeah. we're, we're so wait, wait, it. hold on, hold on. What was what was the full question again? Like, uh, yeah, I'm... when in visual design is ugliness a feature, and who's the best at it? I mean, I, I was just talking about Unreal Engine three games. Right. So, I mean, Unreal Engine three games were all pretty ugly. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a feature in Gears of War to talk about normal yeah. mapping and whatnot, and what that just manifested as dudes whose faces look like they were made of <laughs> melting oatmeal. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, uh, and that that got every god darn dude to sit up and pay attention. They're like, people had up until then, you know, they'd look, they'd they'd seen Master Chief with his perfectly smooth green uh, robotic uh, uh, body part surfaces and been like. You know, I'm not interested. But then you get these guys with the uh, with oatmeal faces, you know, and they're like, "Oh, graphics, man!" You saw a whole bunch of graphics people just come out of the woodwork, you know. It's true, and it was like, I guess, visceral. Visceral was the word of the day, and the viscerality from from the oatmeal faces to how to how gears played, which I can best describe as like driving a truck made of meat. You have an accelerator. You have like a gas pedal yeah. for how you move. It was yeah, the conceit was very unified. So I think that might be a contender. All around me are these oatmeal faces. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Ugliness was a feature there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I don't know. And I mean, it was. It even got to the point where it's like the whole game was about uh, taking cover, and you know, the shooters are often about. Uh, you know, I don't know if you're aware how, of how some streamers and uh, you know the really competitive esports uh fps players play on particularly curious graphical settings that the more casual player might find miserable to have to look at for more than five seconds so that you know this stuff is higher visibility or or whatever um fps is historically especially first uh the single player ones or ones meant to be played pve historically a, a large part of the challenge is is uh kind of impressing upon the player the feeling of of camouflage in the enemies right having to pick your enemies out from uh, amid uh, more camouflaging surroundings right so for example in a call of duty game having to know what the enemy looks like compared to your own guys they they don't uh, they don't make them look completely different right like they're not like wearing red shirts or blue shirts it's not it's not so easy as that to tell the difference between enemy and and good guy so in a way when Gears of War has its its normal mapped, bump mapped, rip mapped, whatever the phrases uh, of the day were, uh, rip mapped uh, uh, surfaces and such, where their stuff is glistening and and kind of pock marked and uh, oatmeal esque, uh, it's just kind of difficult to make out where your dudes are in this chaos of a battlefield, and you feel like a big tough guy for being able to shoot dudes amid all of that, all that juice and all that crust and all that cruft. You know, so I really feel like Gears of War and and its ilk 
they're good at being ugly on purpose and the ugliness factors in to the 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 mechanisms of the game in many ways and maybe that's why uh tecmo's uh quantum theory is the most uh american japanese video game ever oh made. we we hit it we got there maybe it is i don't know that game's not i don't know well it's not who cares who cares maybe it is what is the planet of the base of video games oh is that like a tiktok Planet of the Base was the quote unquote song of the summer, which was kind of yeah. a parody of the Eurobeat stuff from yeah, the Euro s- mid 2000s. Oh, okay. What is the so so of video games? So you're just saying it's most indie games made in like the last 10 years? <laughs> uh, no, because I think those indie games are trying to go uh, harken back to even earlier. Than well, that. I don't know if the timing matters. It's okay. So how do we define what? what's the name of the song again? Planet of the Base, B A S. Planet of the Base. Um, how do we define it? Um, I... It's like a, it's like a purposely hacky, stupid Euro song. Right. Yeah. 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 But also, I believe that there is some genuine appreciation in there. Oh yeah. Oh sure, there is. Yeah. So I, I think that's important to keep. You know, it's not like a cynical game. Right. It is something that intentionally leans into something that is uh, no longer favorable but with some love for it. So, yeah. you know, like ugly PS1 style horror games, maybe. Um, but that's not like fun or catchy, you know, like that's that's more thoughtful yeah. and slow. Yeah. On, on one hand, you could take that in the literal, because obviously there was contemporary stuff coming out alongside that actual, you know, 20 year ago wave of, of Eurodance, um, all the, the Beat Mania stuff that had the, the Eurodance licenses. But oh. the thing uh-huh. the thing that I find uh, part of the appeal of Planet of the Base is that it re- like it's the window dressing around the song. It's how the video shot and it's that it's channeling what Eurodance was channeling back in the age of like Barbie Girl or the the, the Vangabus. Um, there was kind of a fiction, God. a fictional world of a, a, a Eurodance universe with its own rules that was kind of shared amongst artists yeah. at the time. The way the world was portrayed, how carefree everybody was, how fashion worked. Uh, and Space um, Channel 5 world. Yeah, Space Channel 5 or, or Bust a Groove for the PS1 was one that came to me. They, they, they resolved the so. problems with yeah. Dance Off. Yeah. Yeah, games that embody that in that embody that fiction and um, its spirit. Mm-hmm. So it's probably got to be some indie game. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's again, it's something. Yeah, referencing the. Past. I mean, I feel like uh, you know my my earlier joke answer of uh, every indie game. It's it's a lot. I mean, that wasn't necessarily a cynical answer. It's uh, there are a lot of indie games that go. I remember remember this weird thing. Uh, and they're not even remember this weird thing. It's like young people being like, look at this weird old thing I found. It has inspired me. I'm going to make something now, right? So I'm going to make something similar to this thing that I, I've i just learned about. I'm going to make my own mother. I'm going to make my own human Nikki. Like, are those people in the planet of the base, are those people who made that, are they even, you know, not being elitist here, are they even old enough to have been alive during that period of time, Right. Maybe it's something they encountered. Yeah, uh, that's true, because Planet of the Base is defined by its distance from Eurodance being in peak popularity. That's true. Yeah. It's just, I'm having a hard time thinking of, like, unfavorable aesthetics or mechanics that people do other than, like, ugly early 3D. I mean, you're assuming that the person who made this video thinks that Eurodance is ugly. Well... Maybe they do, though. I mean, who doesn't? Well, no, I'm saying the world does not think necessarily favorably of Eurodance, right? Like it, it yeah, is, the world doesn't chill with it. It is it is something that is old fashioned. Um mm-hmm. you might still enjoy it. I still enjoy looking at ugly early 3D games, but you know, it's not in fashion. It's not like people don't want it. And again, in terms of video games, like that that's all that comes to mind for me because I feel like What about that uh Hypnospace Outlaw game that uh makes you feel like you're browsing the internet in the 90s? Oh, that's good. That's actually a really good answer. Yeah. That's that's, that's I mean, I, again, you know, indie games do this and they do it well and they do it in interesting ways. It's just it's hard to immediately come up with one. Maybe that's right though. Yeah. I think that's, that's pretty one. close. I agree. Um I I was my brain was thinking you know what about Bomb Rush Cyberfunk that Jace came out and then I went no no that's like mechanically accessible and people want that was the thing that Frank brought up is like it's it's, yeah. it's fashionable to play 
the how bomb rush plays is fashionable. You bring up hypnospace. How you play hypnospace is inherently obtuse, and I think yeah. that's yeah. that makes it a really good pick. I think bomb rush cyberfunk would be like ninety percent of the way toward being the correct answer, but then they just made a, a video game that people want to play, so it it doesn't it doesn't technically count. Well, I'm giving this point to Tim which means it's time for us to go into our lightning round. Here's what we're doing this week, folks. Uh, I'm going to name the 10 biggest box office bombs in movie history oh, as adjusted for inflation and the year they came out. Your job is to imagine that each of them had a video game tie-in and that you had a position with a magazine or a blog where you had to rate that tie-in out of 10. Okay. Contemporary tie-in. Yes, a contemporary tie-in to each of these movies. We'll start with the movie Pan from 2015, uh, which was the uh, very serious reboot of Peter Pan that had uh, uh, a uh, uh, Nirvana cover in it. Yeah, yeah, with Hugh Jackman. Was Hugh Jackman in that? While playing this bizarre Switch game, uh, I believed I could die. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. What's your score? Uh, that is... Uh, 13.75. Okay. Yeah, but that wouldn't have been on the Switch, though. That would have been on the Wii U. Oh. A Wii U exclusive, in fact, bar- as part of that Ubisoft deal, perhaps. No, it's an, ear- it's an early, it's a late Wii only, like a really late Ooh. Wii only. Oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. I believed I could die, which is good because that's like an R. Kelly quote that's yeah. uh, not actually... Uh, a, a, a Peter. Oh Pan. wait, it's, it's you can fly, not you okay. can fly. No, yeah, no, 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 it's good. It's, it's it's even I better. Love that. That. It's even better. It's like no. the people who uh, I saw at least one review of Bioshock uh, mentioned the the song Under the Sea when they meant Beyond the Sea right. uh, <laughs> with the Django Reinhardt <laughs> <All right>. song. <laughs> okay, anyone else want to do one for Pan? Uh, no. Okay, pass. Uh, okay, then we'll we'll just keep it to whoever's fastest. Or this should... this game failed. This this bizarre Wii game failed to Captain Hook me. Uh, <laughs> so I must pan it. I must pan this game. Pan. Mm, title of the game or uh, a command uh, <laughs> to to this author. <laughs> to this author, Mac, uh, Max Krieger. Um. This this mysterious Wii game whose PS3 and 360 versions were oddly canceled before released <laughs> needed a little more pixie dust and ultimately oh. just oh, remains, there we go. Um, you know as middle of the pack. That's a solid six for me. Six out of solid ten. Solid six. As soon as I <laughs> Yeah, uh, very good. Mars Needs Moms, a 2011 CGI film where Martians come to Earth because they need moms. Mars Need Moms, the way this game needed. <laughs> Come on, bring it home. Some QA. <laughs> Ultimately, bugs really drag this PS3 game down. I don't know. I don't care. You'll think it was a Starship Troopers game with how many <laughs> bugs it has. Mars needs moms as much as this developer needs QA. <laughs> I don't Testers. know what I was expecting when I launched this game, but it certainly wasn't an 80-hour immersive RPG that rivals <laughs> even the Final Fantasy series. I am shocked. I'm in love. It's our publication's first perfect score. <laughs> nice. It. Max? One of the biggest shockers of this game is that it took me five hours to get to my first mom. If the game's called <laughs> Mars Needs Moms, it really needs more moms. The play control is okay, so it gets a three. Play control. <laughs> Love it. Uh, Battleship from 2012. The, oh, uh, shoot. <laughs> the live action movie featuring Rihanna adapting the board game. Oh, yeah. I know what the game is in my head. I just haven't written the review. The problem is I remember the actual game for this, and it's polluting my thoughts. Mm. Okay, well, I don't. So um, I commend the developers for creating an accurate version of the classic board game, but I don't believe it is enhanced by full motion video cutscenes. Pretty good. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Disappointed to find that amidst generic third-person shooter combat, the only callbacks to classic battleship mechanics are long, forced turret sequences. Nothing new here. <laughs> Very good. That sounds good. Tim, you're going to pass? 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Strange World, a CGI movie that came out literally last year that I don't know anything about. Does any? Did anybody see this movie? No. I know of it. Yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal did a voice Jake, in it. Jake G's in there. Yeah. Yeah. I recall seeing several really defeatist Twitter threads. Why can't a movie like this be popular? It's supposed oh, to be pretty no, good. Oh, no. That just makes me not want to. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, that's what the defeatist Twitter threads all seemed to indicate, but in a way that made me, uh, kind of soured me. It's interesting how that happens. Yeah. A fitting send-off for Nintendo's ailing 3DS console. Oh, that's pretty good. A 3DS exclusive, we'd say, for this one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. One of the last games they made. <laughs> Maybe the movie was supposed to have come out like eight years ago. Yeah. And was delayed, but the game had been done for a long time. That, that's, that's the fiction in my head anyway with that review. Uh, Max, you got one? If it was a 3DS game. That's mine, dude. You do whatever you want. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess that's true. What would I be thinking? You can, you, you can riff off of it. It can be a 3DS game. Uh, in my mind, Str uh, Strange Worlds is the game that killed Disney Infinity, and so that legacy will Ooh. shadow it forever. Um, oh, I like uh, that. About sad, uh, huge quantities of Strange World toys to life toys crowding goodwills everywhere is what people <laughs> remember this game for. Uh, our next movie is Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas. This was Shoot. a 2003 movie starring uh, Brad Pitt and Catherine Zeta-Jones and Michelle Pfeiffer, uh, animated by DreamWorks, yeah. an adaptation of Sinbad. This isn't a PS2 game? Oh, no, it's a Game Boy Advance game, dude. Okay. It's got to be. It's it got to no be. no Prince yeah. of Persia, I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah. Way Forward knocks it out of the park again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Excellent. yeah, that's, that's accurate to how critics... Uh, yeah. Next is Cutthroat Island from 1995. I've actually played the actual Cutthroat Island yeah. game yeah, that's quite a, game. a bit. Yeah. That's a real yeah. game. Oh, much like the movie that inspired it, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's I don't know. <laughs> this, this game should uh, be appreciated by more people. I don't know. I don't think that movie's that good, actually. If you're at all interested in this game, and you shouldn't be, take a cue from the characters of the movie and pirate the software. Hey, <laughs> yeah, very good. Max, you got yeah, one? Yeah, yeah. We all thought that the um, uh, original Prince of Persia and Karateka were beautiful, but we aren't Europeans playing in our Amigas. We have 32-bit home consoles now. Why do we need Cutthroat <laughs> Island? Nobody <laughs> needs it. Make it walk the plank. Excellent. Ooh. Man, you're good at that. Walk the plank, yeah. yeah. Uh, next good. is Mortal Engines, the 2018 movie about mobile cities in the post-apocalypse. Mortal Engines. What's a mobile city? What on earth? It, like London was this big tank, uh, and it, huh? it, like fought parrot. It was this huge, what? big budget movie uh, where like all of the cities were like put on these huge mobile platforms, and they were like battleships, and they fought each other. What is this called? Mortal, Mortal Engines. Engines. There's a game for this. It's called Final Fantasy VIII. Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> the gardens. Yeah, Balam Garden. Yeah, this was a huge movie that just absolutely tanked uh, five years ago. <laughs> Tank. Uh, that's pretty good. Nice. Oh, Did yeah. Not intend that. All right. Uh, anyone got anything? Any words for Mortal Engines? I feel like this lightning round's a little bit too paraphernalia. It uh, is and, a little, and yeah. I, I, I've just mentally, I, I mentally checked out like halfway through the first response. I'm sorry. That's fair. We'll call it here. It's too, it's too interesting. Is yeah, that a thing? I, 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 yeah. yeah, I, I wanted to get. Conceptual. How do you know a puzzle game is too difficult? There it is. There it is. It's just well, it's 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 two things, right? Like I think we'd have yeah. fun coming up with the game, but then yeah. to also have to like criticize the game on top of that. Is, yeah, like, it's just a step yeah, too far. and then there's also wrestling with knowledge or lack thereof regarding the film. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I want. I wanted to challenge you. Like Cutthroat Island, if I'm not mistaken, made like less than ten million dollars. Right. On like a hundred million dollar budget, it was like one of the biggest budget movies of all time. It yeah. killed the, the pirate time. movie for like ten. Years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was. Uh, it's actually. It's an all right film. I don't know if any of y'all have seen it. I have seen. I it. have a soft spot for a lot of these mid 1990s adventure films that that harken back to like a, a, a sort of an old Hollywood 
thing. I love the film The Phantom, right? I love The oh, Phantom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... The, dark, I, as, dark Man? Yeah, as a The Phantom liker, I also I happen to like Cutthroat Island for similar reasons. So okay. yeah, it's just it's just m- making too much popcorn in my brain when you bring the these... Rocketeer. these the Rocketeer. In that case, I'm going to call it here, and I'm going to hand the victory over to Max, who's been an excellent guest this week. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Max, your award is that you have to come up with a question for me to ask at the top of our next show. Uh, off mic so they don't know about it uh i'll I'll be in touch with you later for now sounds good this is the point in the show where we get to make our recommendations if we so choose Uh, if you have anything you're working on that you'd like to tell people about or anything that you've been enjoying or engaged in that you think more people should be aware of uh here is your platform um so we 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 do this automatically um you do anyway. You put you push the video game history hour, the other podcast that I do. But um, I'm going to push it here because uh, the last episode that I did was me and Rachel Weil from the Femicom Museum. Mm. Uh, we talked for an hour about a knitting machine. Excellent. Um, so uh, if Ooh. if uh, if you like slightly trolly uh, video game shows like this one, um, you might also like that other one, as there is some continuity there. It's a real, it's a real video game knitting machine. We talk about the Nintendo knitting machine that never came out from 1987. Oh, Rachel, yeah, that... we, we had on this show in episode 194. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. Max, did you did you have some oh yeah uh, discovery there? What was that? Um... No, it's just the. I was just. I, I. I remember seeing a picture for that knitting machine. There was like one ad for it with like a, a knitted Mario or something like that. I, I thought yeah. It was I, <laughs> and, it, and then there's the there's the sewing machine that you could look link a Game Boy Color up to. Weird stuff. So that is that is a separate thing by Singer. Um, from okay. like the early 2000s, the Nintendo knitting machine was an add-on for the NES that was being uh, uh, marketed by actual Nintendo as as a potential add-on for the uh, 1987 uh, sales season in the U.S. Um, bizarre, bizarre thing. Huh. <laughs> I'm reading the Wikipedia entry for the film Cutthroat Island right All now, right. Uh, which is it's pretty good. Uh, Karolko Studios filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy a month before Cutthroat Island was released. Uh, Matthew Modine said other factors contributing to the production costs running out of control included director Rennie Harlan's cost-prohibitive habit of always having three cameras rolling at the same time and Rennie Harlan and star Gina Davis spending large sums to have cases of V8 vegetable juice shipped out to the set in Malta for themselves. Towards the end of shooting, an entire room was found to be full of unopened juice, and everyone present was obliged to drink it. Oh my so God. V8 vegetable juice is the reason uh, the film Cutthroat Island failed. Is that your recommendation this week? No, not really, uh, but also that's exciting. A Hollywood accountant staring you down going, finish your V8 juice. <laughs> finish the God, juice. It. Finish it. Drink it. That's all from an interview from last year. Wow. Or no, wait. No, it's not. It's from 15 years ago. <laughs> it was retrieved in 2022, but uh, okay. well after the movie came out. Uh, interesting. Max, you got anything? Yeah, I got I got one plug. I got a self-plug and another person plug. Um, I stream once in a while. I'm doing something kind of cool over at aqualounge.tv. It's a cute, you know, like aqua, like Barbie girl, lounge, like astrolounge.tv. Um, a little bit, uh, like I'm doing like a hybrid format of, of new games, old games. I try to give stuff like indie games that don't have a publisher a real shot. Do something kind of holistic. It's like Twitch meets Liquid Television is kind of my elevator pitch for it. Ooh. But um, I really rely on a lot of curator work, people finding stuff, like combing, crate digging through itch um, as soon as stuff comes out. One of the ones I really want to shout out is uh, Indie Apocalypse uh, by uh, and a guy by the name of Andrew, uh, goes by Pizza Pranks. He's been doing this work for years. I happened to meet him at a show. He's a wonderful guy. He's putting together um, some of the most, like I don't know, community-centric and forward-thinking game zines uh, that I know of. So give him a look. All right. Uh, Tim, you got anything on your end? No, nothing. I don't got nothing. That's fine. I've got plenty for the both of us. I got plenty for all of us. Here's what I'd like to say. If you enjoyed this episode of Insert Credit, please rate and review our show wherever and however you can. You can also support us on patreon.com slash insert credit, where you could become a patron to submit your own questions, listen to monthly bonus episodes, and more stuff. If you'd like to sponsor our show with an advertisement or personal message, uh, you could do that by messaging me at show at insertcredit.com. You could also join our community at forums.insertcredit.com or find videos of these episodes on youtube.com slash insertcreditshow. 
please look into all the different fine Necrosoft products by our own Brandon Sheffield. And uh, go ahead and check out that video game history hour that Frank Zifaldi does. Knitting. Th- yeah, knitting. Uh, this episode is edited by Esper Quinn with original music by Kurt Felden. I'm Alex Jaffe. I'm Frank Zifaldi. I'm Tim Rogers. And I'm Max Krieger. And women are my favorite guy. Yeah, that was a good time. Yeah, I had fun. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. And I don't know. Thank you for, I don't know, topical questions that I. Yeah, do a fair I, deal I like to do a little bit of research on the guests. I, I could tell. And it was it meant a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I try to make sure nobody is too out of their depth. Thank you. Well, it was it was fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't call myself Nardwar, but it is an aspirational goal. <laughs>